Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to a brand new series that we will be titling uh, the Let Us uh, Let Us Reason uh, video series, and uh, it's apologetic in nature. And uh, today's topic that we will begin with has to do with the doctrine of Tawheed. In fact, we may even call it Tawheed Dilemma. But here is the good news. With me here in studio, my dear brother and friend, Sam Shamoun, uh, who is going to basically discuss with me a number of things that are mentioned in the Quran that contradict what our Muslim friends typically would say about the doctrine of Tawheed, which in their mind, meaning that God, Allah, is an absolute one, has no partners whatsoever. Sam, right. welcome, brother. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here, but as is my habit, I always like to invoke the God and Father of our Amen. Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We trust the Father will bless us. Amen for the glory of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to speak truth clearly and accurately so that we represent what Muslims believe <clears throat> correctly so that they can see the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that Christians can also be emboldened in preaching and proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ. So Amen. we ask the Father to bless us and cover us by the blood of Christ and fill us with the Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, with that said, <clears throat> it is vitally important that we make a distinction between two types of monotheisms, right? You have what's called Unitarian monotheism, mm -hmm. the belief that God is not just a singular being, but a singular person, a singular consciousness. And that's what Muslims Correct. claim. They claim that Allah is a singular person as well as a singular being, even though they may not use the term person, but that's what they believe. Correct. Now, there's also what we call Trinitarian monotheism. This is what we are, that although there's one eternal being, one God, <clears throat> this one God eternally exists as three eternal relationships or as three eternally distinct but inseparable persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And real quickly, let me define the term person because we have Christians who may not know what we mean by person, That's let correct. alone Muslims. That's correct. By the term person, we do not mean a flesh and blood, finite human being. Because when I use the term person, typically the first thing that comes into a person's mind is a flesh and blood temporal human being. That's not how we're using the term person in reference to God. By person, we mean that the Father, as well as the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Father is a person in the sense that he has emotions, divine emotions, a divine mind, a divine will. He has <clears throat> cognizance, meaning he's aware, self-awareness. He, he's aware that he exists, and he's aware that others exist. That's how we use the term person in reference to the Godhead, not a limited, physical, flesh and blood human being. So we believe there are three persons, one God, whereas Muslims would say there's only one person who happens to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we're going to challenge that assertion. Right. We're going to show that even the sources of Islam, particularly the Quran, does not teach Unitarian monotheism. Yeah. And let's start, by the way, with, with one very important uh, verse in the Quran. It's, yes. uh, everybody will see it on the screen right now. It's chapter 15. Uh, chapter 15, verses 28 to 29, and y you see it also. That's right. Tell us, what is the issue here that our Muslim friends need to pay attention to? Well, I want, um, let me just, uh, well, what, do you want to read the verse out loud at first? Yeah, I mean, we'll it, it will say, it. remember when thy Lord said to the angels, I create man of dried clay, of dark loom molded, and when I shall have fashioned him and breathed of my spirit into him, then fall, fall ye down and worship him. Now, obviously, what we find here is an echo of the Genesis account of the creation of the first man, Adam, right? Correct. It's not identical, but we see that the Quran is parroting or echoing the biblical account of the creation of man in Genesis chapter 1, particularly Genesis chapter 2. What we want to emphasize is the role that the Spirit plays in animating the first human being. So my question would be, why did Allah breathe his Spirit into the man? For what purpose? To give him life. So here you see two things. Allah breathed out the Spirit. So the Spirit does not originate from creation. The Spirit isn't a creature that Allah made. <clears throat> the Spirit right. comes forth, springs forth, originates from the very being, the Arabic term, that, the essence of Allah. So he's not a part of creation. That and is I want to show the people what you're saying here. If, yes. you, if we look at the, the slide itself, here, he says, my spirit into him. Right. So it's coming out of Allah. Because it's breathed out of him. Correct. Breathe of my spirit. So if Allah is breathed, now obviously, the Muslims would agree with us, this has to be metaphorical. Well, see, that's also a little tricky, depending on what Muslims you ask. But typically, those Muslims who don't identify as Salafi Muslims, 
if they're Ashari Maturidi and they're not Salafi Muslims, they would say this is metaphorical because Allah is not a physical being. He doesn't have physical breath. So what does the metaphor convey? When we think of the term breath, we think of life because if you don't breathe, you right. can't live. Right. So when it says Allah breathe, that's simply a metaphorical way of saying that the spirit is the very life. In other words, when Allah wants to give life, He gives life through the spirit. So Allah breathed out the spirit, so it originates from Him, into man for the purpose of animating man. So right there you see two things. The spirit originates from Allah. It's a part of Him. Correct. Not part of creation. But the spirit also gives life. He is the one who animates creation. In other words, the spirit is creator and life giver. Now, uh, do the math. Allah, His spirit, my spirit. How many is that? That's two. But I thought Islam teaches absolute Unitarian monotheism, in yeah. Arabic, Tawheed, yeah. which we may define a little later. But So I just want to clarify, what you're trying to do here is to build a systematic case that the spirit that our Muslim friends think is no other than the angel Gabriel, yeah, that's what they think. as we will progress with our teaching. Yes, we'll get into that. So far, from the start, we're seeing that the spirit is actually equal to Allah. Put it this way, if Gabriel is a spirit, then Gabriel is not a creature. He's an eternal essential part of Allah's own being, and He's creator and life giver with Allah. So if you want to say it's Gabriel, then you're going to have to deny He's a creature because He's breathed out by Allah. Now, this is not the only passage. Some will say, well, you're just focusing on one passage. You're ignoring what the Quran teaches in its totality. Well, there's another passage we need to turn to to further confirm that the Quran identifies the Spirit of Allah as distinct from Allah, but co-creator and life giver. Let's go to chapter 19 of the Quran. Verses 16 and 21. And everybody will see that on right the now, screen. actually. Yes. So, uh, <clears throat> let me chapter just... 19, verses 16 to 21. Correct. So here, let's look at chapter 19, 16 to 19. Yes. Yeah, and we don't need 20, 21. But if you notice what it says, and I'm looking at the screen to see, it says, when men mention Maryam, Maryam, that's the Arabic term for Mary, the Blessed Mother Correct. of our Lord. Correct. So this is proclaiming the annunciation of the birth of our Lord Jesus to his Blessed Mother. Correct. The birth annunciation of Christ. It says, mention Miriam in the book when she drew aside from her family to an eastern place. So she took a veil to screen herself from them. Now here's where it's going to get really exciting for Christians who may have been misled into thinking that the Quran denies there's a plurality within the essence of Allah. Because that's what Muslims will typically tell you, right? Correct. Allah is absolutely one in person and being. We don't believe in a plurality of divine persons. Well, watch here. Then we sent to her our spirit. And I want to make a note. Because those who don't, who don't read Arabic right. may be reading a translation that says, Our angel. However, since you are a native Arabic speaker, Arabic is your mother tongue, you can confirm that the Arabic word here is ruh. That's right. It doesn't say... Now, what is the Arabic word for angel? Uh, malak. And now, you can confirm, They can, if someone reads Arabic, they can confirm as well. It doesn't use that term. It uses the term ruh. That's right. We sent our Ruh spirit. But here's what's amazing. This spirit appeared to her in a well-made well man. So now notice Allah's spirit can assume human form. Correct. Allah's spirit can appear as a man, manifest as a human being. That's right. But then it gets better. Well-made man. Now, you see that, right? But then it gets better. Mary is not aware this is the spirit of Allah appearing as a man. She thinks it's an actual flesh and blood male trying to do something to violate her. So we'll notice what she says. She says, surely I fly or I seek for refuge from you to the beneficent God. I seek Allah's protection from you if you're one guarding against evil. Now notice what he says. The Spirit now has a conversation with Mary. He said, I am only an apostle of your Lord. So he's a Rasul. So here we right. see that the Spirit is subject subordinate to Allah. He is the messenger, apostle of her Lord, apostle of Allah. But then he says something amazing, that I will give you a pure boy. That's right. And he is talking in the first person here. I will. Who is the I? This apostle. Who is this apostle? The spirit who appeared as a man. So the spirit didn't say Allah will give you. I have been sent specifically to give you a pure boy. So here we see that Jesus' sinlessness is affirmed. That Mary's going to conceive a child that's absolutely pure. So it affirms the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. But what I want people to notice here is that the Spirit appears as a man, can speak and be spoken to. So it shows that Allah's Spirit is not simply Allah's power, 
his strength or his force. He's an actual person distinct from Allah. So notice it says, I am a messenger of your Lord. And I'm only a messenger from your Lord. That means Allah and the Spirit are not identical, are they? That's They're right. two different persons, right? That's right. And yet the Spirit gives life because he says, I was sent specifically to give to you as a virgin, conceive as a virgin, a pure son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though the crown doesn't call him Lord, but you get the point. Yeah. So what do we establish in this passage? The Spirit is a person. You can speak to him. He can speak to you. The Spirit can appear as a man, <clears throat> appear in human form, and the Spirit creates life. Another passage testifying to the fact that the Spirit, distinct from Allah, subject to Allah, can give life and create the way Allah does. So my question is, how can the Spirit not be God when He can do the things that only God can do, namely create and give life? Yeah, and that's true. And again, I just want to emphasize one thing. A Muslim may be wondering, why are we trying to prove that the Quran does not teach Tawheed? Because we don't believe the Quran is the revelation of Allah. That is true. I mean, when I say That's Allah, very important. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and again, when I say Allah, because again, I am Semitic, I use a term for God, it's Allah, and you speak Arabic, so when you speak of the true God, you say Allah. I do not believe the Allah of the Quran is the true God of the Bible. Amen. <clears throat> and I don't believe the Quran is revelation. But the reason why I'm appealing to the Quran is for the benefit of Muslims. They believe in it. So if I was speaking to a Muslim, I'd say, since you believe in the Quran, let me show you what your scripture teaches about the nature of Allah, so that although we're going to establish that the Quran does not teach Tawheed, in fact, the Quran presents a trinity of sorts, Allah of the Quran and the trinity of the Quran is not the true God. It's a satanic counterfeit, a counterfeit trinity, a counterfeit God erected by Satan to mislead people from the true God revealed in Jesus Christ, as documented in the Holy Bible, the only word that God has inspired and preserved for a dying and erring mankind. So I just want to be clear, we're appealing to the Quran for the benefit of Muslims. If I was talking to an atheist, I would never touch the Quran. But since Muslims believe in it, we're appealing to it. With that said, let's continue discussing what the Quran says about the Spirit being co-creator and life giver with the Muslim deity. Because we mm -hmm. established the Spirit is not identical to Allah. He's breathed out from Allah, he belongs to Allah, he's the messenger, apostle of Allah, so that shows a distinction. Though they're distinct and the Spirit is subordinate to Allah, at the same time the Spirit does what only God can do. So let's look at chapter 66, verse 12, recalling in the previous episode that when the Spirit appeared to Mary, he said, I've been sent to give to you, I have been sent to create life in you, to give to you a pure son. Now, in 66.12, we're actually told how the Spirit impregnated Mary. Correct. Because the Quran does affirm the virginal conception and birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. No Muslim can be a Muslim if he denies that Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary without sexual intercourse. If they deny it, they're no longer true Muslims because they're denying the Quran. So at least the Quran here we say, right, you got it right here because it agrees with the Bible. Anytime the Quran agrees with the Bible, amen, it's right. When it disagrees with it, it's not the Word of God. But in 66.12, notice what it says. Mary, daughter of Imran. And side note, there's a lot of you know, meat to cover, a lot of topics. The Quran assumes that Jesus' maternal grandfather, his name was Imran, and it says that Mary's the daughter of Imran, and that Mary's mother is the wife of Imran, and that Mary's also the sister of Aaron, in chapter 19, verse 22. Now, why is that interesting? The only Mary whose father's name was Imran, who had a brother named Aaron, is the sister of Moses. Which is 1,300 <clears throat> years earlier. Yeah, at least. 13 to 1,400 years. Yeah. So here we have Jesus' mother identified as a sister of Moses. Because if you go to Numbers 26, 59, there we're told Amram, Imran being the Quranic equivalent of Amram. That's right. His wife, Yochebed, gave birth to Maryam, mm -hmm. which coincidentally is the Hebrew form of Maryam which is the Arabic Mary, word for exactly. Jesus' mother, Maryam, and Aaron, Harun, and Musa, Moses. So the mother of Jesus in the Quran is none other than the sister of Moses. So should we just prove that she is also uh, pre-existent? You better believe she's quite old. She's been living for about 1,500 years by the time she... So Jesus is the nephew of Moses and Aaron. Now, with that said, notice it says, And Mary, the daughter of Imran, who guarded her chastity, not getting too graphic or too detailed, you and I both know that's not what the text says. That's right. It says that's she right. guarded her, and I'm going to give a G-rated version, her private part. 
Farjaha. Right. Farj. Yeah, that's correct. It guarded her private part. And then it says, we breathe into it, fihi, into what? Her private part of our spirit. So my question to you, why is the Quran telling me that Allah breathed his spirit into Mary's private part? For what purpose? To basically uh, bring <clears throat> Jesus uh, basically uh, into life. Yes. So you're saying that yeah. the reason why the spirit entered her body was to cause her to conceive Jesus? That's right. So basically, the Quran is saying it's the spirit that created the human nature, the physical body of Christ? Now, how can that be if the spirit is not God? Because Allah, and only Allah, according to the Quran, is creator and life giver. Yet here, again, we see Allah breathing the spirit. Right. That means the spirit is not part of creation. It originates from Allah. It comes out of Allah. It proceeds forth from the very that, the essence of Allah, breathe out by Allah, entering into Mary's body, causing her to, to conceive life. What more evidence do the Muslims need to end up seeing that this spirit is not a creature? He's part of Allah, yep. so he's yep. eternal. He can appear as a man, so he's a person. He's personal, he has personhood, creates and gives life. And we'll show uh, our friends right here. So for instance, look in the slide who is speaking. And we, that's Allah speaking, breathe basically therein into the private part of our spirit, okay? Another distinction. And uh, that's what happened. The spirit of <coughs> Allah basically representing Allah in this case yes. is the one who uh, caused Mary to conceive. Yeah, there's no, there, there's no way of getting around the plain teachings of the Quran. And this is not the only time where it says that Allah breathed the spirit into Mary. The other passage, which we don't need to bring up on the screen, but it's in chapter 21, verse 91, where again she's called the daughter of Imran, right? It says, again, Allah breathed into her. It says, the daughter of Imran, who guarded her private part, we breathe into her. Now, interestingly, there the preposition is fiha, breathe into her. Right. Whereas here in 66.12, it's fihi, breathe into him, or referring to the private part. But both these passages explicitly teach, Allah breathed his spirit, into Mary to cause Mary to get, get pregnant with Jesus. Now, there is an alternate way of understanding these passages, but we'll do that in a future session. The fact remains that if a Muslim is going to follow what the Quran teaches, not what later Islamic theology teaches, that the spirit is Jibreel and Jibreel is a creature, if you just let the Quran speak, and ironically, there's a famous Muslim apologist named Shabir Ali, who's part of a show called let the Quran speak. So if we let the Quran speak, clearly the spirit is not a creature. The spirit is subject to Allah, subordinate to Allah, distinct from Allah, originates from Allah, so he's eternal, he's not, you know, not part of creation, and creates and gives life. What else do Muslims need to be convinced <clears throat> regarding the spirit's divine identity, his divine personhood? Amen. And, um, you know, I really, it's, it's a deep topic. Um, I think we need to at least uh, uh, pause here yes. so we can continue in the next episode. And, um, you know, we want our uh, listeners, basically, and viewers uh, to go back to uh, uh, video number one and continue uh, so that you can see the logic that we are trying to establish for you so that this one will make sense even more based on that foundation that is being um, uh, laid out. But, I mean, I, I believe also every video at least has a powerful point in it, you know. For instance, this video uh, once again shows that uh, the spirit of Allah is distinct from Allah and has also the power uh, to cause life to come into existence. And in this case, of course, the conception of our, uh, the, the, the fleshly, uh, basically the body of our Lord into existence. So, Sam... What are we going to talk about next time? Lord willing, in the next uh, two sessions at least, we're going to discuss that the Holy Spirit possesses the very unique names of Allah, names that cannot be given to a creature, and prove that the Holy Spirit is not in a created angelic being. Now today, uh, we are going to begin to show also some characteristics and descriptions, sifat, basically, that are applied to the Spirit that are divine That's right. attributes. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the word sifat because if you're dealing with Salafi Muslims, not all Sunni Muslims are Salafi Muslims. The largest Islamic sect is the Sunni sect. It's about 85% of those who profess to be Muslims. Not that those who claim to be Sunni understand Sunni theology. 
Among Sunni Muslims, you have the sect called the Salafi sect. We call them Salafi, or in the West, they're called Wahhabis. According to this branch of Islam, they divide Tawheed. Tawheed, and again, we keep using that term. Tawheed is simply the Arabic term that was coined to denote the oneness of the Islamic God. Tawheed, oneness. According to Salafi theology, Tawheed is divided into three branches. Now, other Sunni Muslims don't divide them into three branches. That's they right. think it's an innovation. But... Salafi Muslims say that there are three branches to Islam. There's Tawheed al rububiyyah the oneness of Allah's sovereignty, His Lordship. Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah. Uluhiyyah or Ibadah, the yeah. oneness of Allah's worship. And then you have Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat. So you know that because you come out of that mindset. That's right. Now, Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat means that Allah possesses certain names and characteristics that cannot be ascribed to a creature. Now, that needs further qualification. This branch of Islam says that certain names and descriptions cannot be attributed to a creature in their definite forms. Now, what does that mean? For example, I can speak of someone possessing Rahma, but I cannot say he is Ar-Rahman. See, now I place the definite article before that now. That's right. Ar-Rahman or Ar-Rahim or Al-Qudus. Anytime <clears throat> these characteristics are are prefixed with the definite article, the, you cannot attribute it to a creature. Now, if you wonder why that's the case, you're going to have to ask the Salafi Muslim. That's their theology. They came up with it. That's how they define it. I'm simply reporting what they believe. So I can say Rahman to someone, but I can't say Ar Rahman. I cannot put the definite article before that because that is only true of Allah. Now, with that said, if the Spirit is a creature, to then ascribe some of the very unique names, characteristics of Allah to this creature would be a violation of Tawheed. It would be shirk. And what is shirk? Ascribing yes, right. to Allah a creature in his unique divine qualities, names, worship, and sovereignty. You cannot associate a creature with Allah in these categories of Tawheed. Now, interestingly, <clears throat> Islamic theology teaches that two out of the 99 names of Allah happen to be the Holy One and the Faithful One. Now, if you don't mind, brother, if you can look at chapter 59, verse 23 of the Quran, and you'll see that one of the names of Allah is that He's the Holy One, right? And we are going to show our friends right now um, 59, this, 23. this particular slide right here, and they can see it uh, with us right now. That's right. So there you see what is the sum of the names of Allah, right? It says, He is Allah. Mm -hmm. Than whom there is no other God, the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One. And here is right here. This is the Holy One, the definite article description yes. of Allah Himself. Yeah. Al Qudus. And anyone who needs Arabic, uh, reads Arabic, sees it's the definite article is prefixed to it. Al Qudus. And then other names, the peace, salam, the keeper of faith, etc., etc. So that's one of His names. Another passage is chapter 62, verse 1. And we will go there right now. And, chapter uh, 62, verse 1. And Again, you see it? You see it right says, here. All that is in the heavens and all that is in the earth, glorify Allah, the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One, Al-Qudus. Once again, right here, it is Allah, the Holy One. Yeah, so remember what Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat teaches? When you prefix the definite article before the noun or characteristic, it can only be ascribed to Allah. That's right. Al-Qudus, the, the L Holy talking One. About. Right? Lo and behold, what do we find in the Quran? At least on <clears throat> three occasions, the Holy Spirit is called Al Qudus. Let's look at it in chapter 2, verse 87. Chapter 2, verse 87, the first occurrence, right? And right? We'll go right here. And you said it's. Uh... Chapter 2, verse 87. I said three occasions, actually four times, but still. In chapter 2, verse 87, you're going to see there, it's, it's, he's called the Holy Spirit. I am, uh, uh, while I'm trying to find the verses, uh, go ahead and begin to describe those. Uh, okay, well, I'll get it. I have it here, but let me just read it for you. And we gave Moses the book, and after him sent succeeding messengers, and we gave Jesus, son of Mary, the clear signs, and confirmed them with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Ruh al-Qudus. Notice he's the spirit that is holy, Al Qudus, right? So here, Ruh Al Qudus. So one of the names of the spirit is he is called the Holy One. 
the Spirit, the Holy One. Now we have it on the screen, and right. you'll see it right there. Correct. All right, so so now again, remember what Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat teaches. The names of Allah in their definite form cannot be ascribed to a creature. Yet here you have the Holy Spirit called Ruh al-Qudus, which is simply the noun form of the adjective Qudus. But he's called Al-Qudus, Al-Qudus, right? So the definite article. According to Tawheed, this is a violation of the unity of Allah if the Spirit is a creature. Now, this is not the only time he's said to be holy. You also find it in chapter 2, verse 253, which we'll look at. Chapter 2, verse 253. I have it on the screen. And we we gave Jesus, Son of Mary, the clean, clear signs and confirmed him with the Holy Spirit. As everyone can see on the screen, the Once word again. there, holy, is in the definite form. It's Al-Qudus, right? The adjective form of the noun Qudus. Al-Qudus, Al-Qudus, it's basically the same word, same meaning. One Correct. is the adjective form, the other is the noun form. So, But it's the same meaning, comes from the same root, it has the same characteristic. He is the Holy One. So this spirit is the Holy One. So that was chapter 2. Verse 87, chapter 2, verse 253. It also appears in chapter 5, verse 110. But we're going to skip to chapter 16, verse 102. So it's actually four times, on four occasions, the Spirit is said to be the Holy One. So you the want to go Holy. To 16, 102, 102. And we have it on the screen right now. Right. Say, the Holy Spirit has brought down the revelation from thy Lord. Notice again, it's Ruch el Qudus. That's right. The definite article is there, right here. So, four times the Quran calls the Spirit the Holy One. The Holy, not just Holy, in the definite form, which according to Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat, cannot be attributed to a creature. So, my question to the Muslim would be, if the Spirit is a creature, if he's Jibreel, how could the Quran ascribe one of the unique names of Allah in the definite form to this creature without this being a violation of Tawheed. The only option is to say the Spirit is not a creature, but the Spirit is also fully divine, co-equal with Allah in one sense. But then, if that's the case, then that means that Islam does not teach, the Quran does not teach Tawheed. If Tawheed means there's only one person who is God, because Allah and His Spirit, they're distinct. They're not the same person. They're not the same entity. And yet both of them are described as the Holy One, which would be a violation of Tawheed if the Spirit is a creature. Now, what do you do with that? Absolutely. And uh, I hope our Muslim friends can see for themselves that the very Quran that they believe in actually reveals things about the Spirit that are totally different than what's in their mind. And, and that's what we discover, by the way, Sam. I mean, it's uh, you, you deal with Muslims all the time, you know, whether apologists or those who want to be apologists. Nevertheless, uh, they're fixated on emotional arguments Precisely. rather than factual arguments. Yes, yes. And to conclude this part, I just want to affirm another divine title ascribed to, to the Spirit. Allah is called Al-Amin, the faithful. Al-Amin, right. that's one of His names. Now in chapter 26, verse 193 of the Quran, chapter 26, verse 193, it refers to the Spirit as the faithful Spirit. Al-Ruh Al-Amin has descended with it. Al-Ruh Al-Amin. So the Spirit is called Al-Amin. So two of the 99 names of Allah. Right. Al-Ruh al Al-Amin, and He's also Ruh Al-Qudus, the Holy One, the Faithful One. Two of the names of Allah are ascribed to the Spirit. According to Islamic theology, the Spirit must be God for Him to be called Al-Ruh Al-Qudus and Al-Ruh Al-Amin. Amen. There's no way around it. So uh, that, that's great, brother, and obviously uh, I agree with you. This will require a number of uh, uh, sessions, basically, to be uh, to unpack. Uh, what would be uh, the next topic yes. uh, that we will be sharing with our viewers? God willing, in the next topic, we're going to talk about the proof from the Quran that shows the Spirit cannot be a mere created angelic being. He's not an angelic creature, because that's what they want us to believe, that he is the angel Gabriel, and Gabriel supposedly a creature. But we're going to demonstrate from the Quran itself, just using the Quran, the Spirit cannot be a mere created angelic being. And Thank you, my brother. Yes. So what, what are we going to talk about today? Yes. <clears throat> well, today we're going to culminate the series we began on what the Quran says about the Spirit. And again, I just want to make clear, 
I'm not trying to prove that the spirit of the Quran is the same spirit revealed in the Holy Scriptures. I don't believe that. I believe the Quran is a counterfeit concocted by Satan, where Satan inspired Muhammad to preach a false Jesus, a false spirit, a false gospel, and present a false God to mislead people from the true God. My aim is to show the Muslims who do believe in the Quran that the Quran does not teach Tawheed. So I just want to be clear. I don't want people to think that I believe, hey, the Holy Spirit of the Quran is the Holy Spirit of the Bible. To me, that's blasphemous. That is true. It's a counterfeit, a satanic counterfeit trying to replace the true spirit with a counterfeit one. So may the Lord Jesus save Muslims from this satanic counterfeit and bring them into the truth of the gospel that he proclaimed Amen. so they can be saved. Now, with that said, we have demonstrated that the Quran does teach that Allah's spirit Though distinct from Allah, subordinate to Allah is fully God because he can do things that only God can do, and he's a person. He can appear as a man, which, by the way, is interesting because Muslims want to tell you that it is beneath the glory and majesty of Allah to appear as a man or become a man. However, Allah's own spirit, whom he breathes out, who comes out of him, who's part of him, can appear as a man. So if it's beneath the dignity of Allah to appear as a man, then what are they saying about the Spirit of Allah? That the Spirit of Allah did something that was inglorious, something that was shameful, but for the Spirit to appear as a man, and yet Allah won't appear as a man, are you saying that the Spirit is beneath Allah, even though He's inseparable from Allah, so a part of Allah does something inglorious to shame Allah? So that's another problem, another dilemma for the Muslims. What I want to focus right now in this particular session is to show from the Quran that the Spirit cannot be Gabriel because the Spirit cannot be an angelic creature because that's what they'll tell you. Muslim scholars will tell you the Spirit is the angel Gabriel. We're going to prove from the Quran that cannot be the case. So if you don't mind, if you can go to chapter 16 verse 2 of the Quran and read for us right. what 16 verse 2 says about the Spirit's relationship to the angels. And I'm going to be reading like uh, from Pechthel, for instance, and it says, He, speaking of Allah, sends down the <coughs> angels with the Spirit That's right. of His command, unto whom He will of His bondmen, saying, Warn mankind that there is no God save me, so keep your duty unto me. Now, did you catch it? He sends the angels with the Spirit by His command. In other words, Allah orders and commands the angels and the Spirit to come down. So this again shows two things. The angels are a distinct group, a distinct category from the Spirit. That's correct. Because if the Spirit was an angel, why exclude Him, differentiate Him from the angels? Why not include him in that category? The fact that it says the, the angels with the Spirit shows they're not the same category being. But it also shows that the Spirit is subject to Allah because Allah orders the Spirit, commands the Spirit. So the Spirit can only come down when Allah orders him, though the Spirit is breathed out by Allah and inseparable from him. So those are the two facts we establish from this passage. Now, this is not the only passage. There are other passages that affirm that the Spirit is distinct from the angels and that both angels and the Spirit have to obey the commands of Allah. Can you go to chapter 70, verse 4 of the Quran? Chapter 70, verse 4 reads as follows. To him, this is Arbery's translation, to him the angels and the Spirit mount up in a day whereof the measure is 50,000 years. So again, we have the angels on one side and the Spirit differentiated from them, right? That's correct. The angels and the Spirit. Now again, if the Spirit is an angel, then he should be part of this category, this group of angels, because it says angels in general, not some angels, angels as a whole, and yet the Spirit is distinguished from them, showing the Spirit is not an angel, but different from them. Now this, again, is not the only passage. Let's go to 78.38. 7838 uh, reads, On a day when the angels and the spirits stand arrayed, they speak not, save in him whom the uh, benef uh, beneficent allowed and who speaks right. So again, angels and the spirit, two different categories. The angels one side, the spirit on the other side, and again affirms that the spirit with the angels is subordinate, subject to Allah. Now, Angels are creatures, so by their very nature, they're subject to Allah. But here's what's ironic. The Spirit is breathed out by Allah, so He's an eternal part of Allah. He's not part of creation. That's correct. And yet at the same time, the Spirit is subject to Allah. It almost sounds like there's a hierarchy within the Godhead of Islam. And our Muslim friends are up in arms when we show that Jesus the Son 
submitted to the will of the Father. Yeah, or the Holy Spirit in the Bible is also right. subject to the Father and the Son. So now That's here right. we have a hierarchy within the Godhead of Islam. The Spirit breathed out by Allah, so He's an eternal, inseparable part of Him, not part of creation, creates, gives life, appears as a man, can speak and be spoken to, and yet He is subject to the command of Allah. And yet we're told that Islam teaches absolute pure monotheism. Now, that's not the only passage. So far, three passages, right? right. Let's go for a fourth one. Chapter 97, verse 4. 97 verse 4 reads as follows. The angels and the spirit, here we go again. Distinction. The angels and the spirit descend therein by the permission of their Lord, by the leave of their Lord, mm. with all decrees. So again, we find the same thing that we saw in the other passages. The spirit, one side, angels on another side. They're not the same category or class of being. They're distinct, proving the spirit cannot be an angel. But at the same time, the spirit, like the angels, has to come down by permission of Allah. So he's subject to the will, command, and order of Allah. That's right. I don't think you get any clearer than this, or do you? There's actually another passage that's even more explicit. Chapter 17, verse 85. And this one is very interesting, by the way, 1785. And here is the setting. <clears throat> Muhammad was asked, actually, by people, tell us, who is the spirit? Yeah, and it says, Ar-Ruh, the spirit. That's right. Not just the spirits in general. So, Sam, this would have been the perfect moment right. for the prophet of Islam to say, it's Gabriel. Exactly. Why is everybody... You know, <laughs> Where's the debate? That's right. So, here's what it reads. They are asking thee concerning the spirit. Say, the spirit is by command of my Lord and of knowledge ye have been vouchsafed but little. Let's read the Arbery translation. They will question thee concerning the Spirit. Say, the Spirit is of the bidding of my Lord. You have been given of knowledge nothing except wow. a little. So wait, again the Spirit is subject to the command of Allah. And when he's asked the identity of the Spirit, he says, we only know a little about the Spirit. In other words, don't ask too much about the Spirit's identity because we don't know. Muhammad doesn't know. Like you said, the perfect opportunity for Muhammad to have said Gabriel, he didn't. He said, we only know a little about the Spirit, so stop probing about the identity of the Spirit. End of story. If a Muslim wants to insist the Spirit is Gabriel, that means he knows more than his own prophet, because his own prophet, when asked, says, we don't know much about the Spirit. Now let's put the icing of the cake to end this particular aspect of the Tawheed dilemma. Not only did you see those passages where the angels are distinguished from the Spirit, or where Muhammad says that when it comes to the Spirit, we don't know much about him, we have a passage in which we have Allah distinguished from the angels. Go to chapter 89, and if you can. Chapter 89, verses 21 to 22. 89? 21 to 22. 21 and see what it says there. To 22. And uh, Bechthel? Yes, fine. All right. What does it say? And we will go there right now, and I'll tell you. Here's what it says. Nay, but when the earth is ground to atoms, grinding, grinding, and thy Lord shall come with angels, rank on rank. Safan, Safa. And know, actually, basically. the word Safan was also used in 7838, where the spirit and angels will stand in ranks. Now, which Muslim would deny that their Lord, thy Lord, Muhammad's Lord, is not an angel? Because here it says, thy Lord with the angels. Two That's different right. categories, right? Exactly, exactly. But when the same language is used of the Spirit, the angels and the Spirit, the Spirit and the angels, why then would they assume that the Spirit is an angel when clearly the Spirit is distinguished from all angels in the same way that Allah is distinguished from all angels? Not only that, but there is one verse, for instance, where it says, Who is the enemy of Allah, his angels? Gabriel, you know, Michael. Michael. I mean, you have like different categories yes. that are being distinct. So, each other. no debate, as far as the Quran is concerned, to sum up, the Spirit is not a created angelic being. The Spirit is distinguished from all angels. The Spirit is breathed out from Allah, so He's an eternal, inseparable part of Allah. The Spirit is subject to Allah. The Spirit creates and gives life like Allah does, and the Spirit can appear as a man, can speak and be spoken to. In other words, the Quran affirms the Spirit is an eternal, divine person, inseparable from Allah. Before we even get into the topic, I want to repeat what I've said in previous sessions, and I'm going to sound like a broken record, but it's vitally important we do this. We do not believe the Quran is revelation of Allah, meaning when I say Allah, meaning the God revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. We don't believe it's revelation from the true God. We don't believe the Muslim God is the true God revealed in Scripture. We don't believe the Quranic Isa is the Jesus of the New Testament, who's the Jesus of history. 
or the spirit presented the Quran as a true spirit. So then why are we appealing to the Quran? We're doing it for the benefit of those Muslims who do believe the Quran is revelation from the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I want to be clear. The Islamic Jesus is not the true Jesus revealed in the New Testament. The, the spirit uh, revealed in the Quran is not the spirit revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. And so I want to emphasize that, lest Muslims think that we're endorsing the Quranic view of Jesus. Now, with that said, <clears throat> it is true that the Quran does seek to demote Jesus to the level of a mere human servant. But at the same time, the Quran makes assertions about Jesus Christ that shows he's more than a mere human servant. He's more than a man. He's greater than all creation, infinitely greater than Muhammad, subject only to Allah, who's supposed to be the true God, and yet equal with Allah in a certain sense. So he's subject to him, but at the same time equal to him. And I'm going to focus on those passages to show that a, the Quran only has a contradictory portrait of Jesus, but B, the Quran clearly testifies to Jesus' divine pre-human existence and essential equality with the Muslim God who's supposed to be the true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So let's start with chapter 3, verse 45, and focus on the titles that the Quran ascribes to Jesus Christ. So 345, what, says, what does it say? And our uh, <laughs> list, uh, well, I mean, viewers will watch this. Uh, when the angel said, Mary... God gives thee good tiding of a word from him whose name is Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. High honored shall he be in this world and the next, near stationed to God. Now, I want, want us to focus on the fact that Jesus is said to be a word from him. That's right. So here is the yeah. a word from, and the That's him right. here obviously is in reference to yeah, because God. it says that the name of the word even says kalimat minhu ismuhu, whose name is. So the word has a personal identity. That's right. His name, his identity That's is right. the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. Correct. And this is in connection to the word. So the word is a person who becomes a flesh and blood human being. So Are here you talking we see, about John 1, uh, 14 here? Well, or? yeah, because yeah. here we see the Quran is aping yep. uh, John's logos, logos, Christology, that Jesus Christ is the eternal word that became flesh. And I'll unpack that when we go to the second passage. But notice, it says Jesus is a word from him, and it says this word, his name, is the Messiah, Jesus, Son of Mary. So the word is not simply God's command or God's plan. It's an actual living person that becomes a flesh and blood human being. And here's what I want to add. Uh, it's kind of amazing, really. Yeah. Kalima, kalimatun minhu. Kalima is... <laughs> Feminine. That's right. Yet the name is masculine. Yeah. Jesus. Is masculine. Even Ismuhu, isn't that masculine? That's right. So here yeah. you have Kalimat, which is in the feminine gender. Not Ismaha, Ismuhu. Oh, yeah, and yet it's a masculine figure. That's right. Right? So That's that right. again shows you that Muhammad is hearing what Christians are saying about Jesus. That's right. Identifying him as the word and adopting it as part of his theology to entice Christians to take him seriously, not realizing by accepting that part of Christian theology. He ends up refuting himself. Let's go to the second one. This one is where we're going to really show the connection with John's logos or word Christology. In chapter 4, verse 171, it's a long passage. And here's what's ironic about this passage. This passage is intended to rebuke Christians for saying Allah is a third of three and censoring them for saying that Allah has a son. And yet what it says about Jesus clearly affirms that Jesus is divine exactly. and pre-existed and became flesh. What does it say in chapter 4, verse 171? People of the book, go not beyond the bounds in your religion and say not as to God, but the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only the messenger of God. Now let's pause there. You know Arabic better than I could ever know it because it's your mother tongue. The word only is not in the Arabic. It doesn't say only the messenger. That's right. It says That's right. he was Rasulullah. Now, for those who don't know the, what the word Rasul means, it can also mean apostle. So what this is saying is Jesus, notice, he's the Messiah, al Messiah. We'll impact that in future sessions, God willing. He's Messiah, al Messiah, the only one called Messiah, by the way. Son of Mary, which affirms his virginal conception and birth, which we'll talk about in a future session. Rasulullah, which can be rendered as Apostle of Allah, which is supposed to be the true God. Now, for a Christian, you can amen all of that. Thus far, what the Quran says, we have no objections. Because if you go to Hebrews 3, verse 1, Jesus is said to be the Apostle That's right. and High Priest of our confession. So the Bible acknowledges Jesus is the Apostle of God the Father. And here's what I want to add. We already demonstrated that according to the Quran, the Spirit... 
is also an apostle. Is the apostle. That's right. That's so right. you have Jesus, the Word, apostle of God, and the Spirit, apostle of God. Now let's continue further into the passage. So it says, was only the messenger of God and his word that he committed to Mary and a spirit from him. Let's park it there. You know the Arabic again. So the only reason I'm feeling the Arabic is because you can confirm what I'm saying. There it says, kalimat. Kalimatuhu, Kalimatuhu, his word, Al-Qaha, Illa right. Maryam. Al-Qaha means cast down. That's right. And his evolved word, what? Cast down yeah. to Mary. Now, yeah. a spirit proceeding from him, Ruh and Min. Now, if you say he is the word that came down to Mary, that implies that before he came down, he was already there, up there with Allah. pre How do you get around you know? that? A child is born, a son is, is given. given to us. And here the word comes down to Mary, which means that before he came down, he was with Allah, his word. And then it says a spirit from him. Now that makes perfect sense. Why? Because before Jesus was born and conceived from his blessed mother to take on flesh, he would have existed as spirit. Prior to becoming flesh, Jesus, as the eternal word, the divine word, would have existed as spirit. He would have been bodiless, immaterial, like the Father is. The Father is spirit, right. Son is spirit, the Holy Spirit is spirit, meaning bodiless, immaterial. <clears throat> Galatians 4, 6 said, God sent his, the spirit of his Son. The, son of the spirit of his Son, the Holy Spirit in our hearts. So catch it here. Jesus existed as spirit when he was there with God. When he came down as his word to become flesh for Mary's. Thus far, what you just read in the Quran is basic Johannine Logos Christology, That's the right. word Christology of John. The eternal word with God the Father, who came down as a spirit to become flesh from his blessed mother. Now, does the Bible say that Jesus, before he became flesh, and now, in virtue of his divine nature, is a divine spirit? In other words, as God, who possesses the divine nature, he is spirit by nature, because to be God is to be spirit. Yes. 1 Corinthians 15.45 says... The first Adam became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Thus far, what we read in the Quran, no Christian would have a problem with. Amen. He is the Messiah. He is the virgin-born son of Mary. He is the apostle of God the Father. He is God's word that came down to Mary and came down from God as a spirit because prior to coming down to Mary, he didn't have a flesh body. He became an embodied spirit when he took on flesh from Mary. So which part of that verse would a Christian have a problem with? Nothing so far. So far we agree, right? But now That's let's right. bring out the implication in this session. If he is the word of God, kalimatuhu, his word. My question to the Muslim is, has there been a time in which Allah has existed without his word? And the answer should be no, because if you say yes, that means Allah was mute. Exactly. And he was... Lacking something essential right. that he had to acquire later on. He's so a profound complete. change occurred in his being. But they would tell you that Allah is perfect and immutable. So Allah has always existed with his word. But if Jesus is his word, and his word is eternal, always existing with Allah, then Jesus as the word always existed with Allah. Therefore, Jesus is not a creature, but eternal co-equal with God, who then became flesh. Now, how do you get around that? Now, there are ways in which Muslims get around this. They'll tell you, he's not the word of God because he himself is the word. They'll say that he's called the word of God because Allah created him by his word, by his command. Kun, right. But the, the verse doesn't say that. Exactly. Now, what they will try to do is, they'll try to go to chapter 3, verse 59 of the Quran, where it says, the likeness, the similitude of Jesus before Allah is like the similitude of Adam, whom he created from dust, and he said, be, and he is. So they'll say, see, Jesus is, this creation is likened to that of Adam, in that Adam was from dust, and Allah said, be to him, and he was. That's why Jesus is called the Word of God. Well, that verse in itself provides refutation of that argument. Understand what is being said. Because Jesus is created by the command of God, he can be called the Word of God. But in 359, it says that Adam was created by the Word of God, his command. In fact, in 1640, it says basically everything is created by the command of Allah, by the command of God, the Word of Allah. If that argument is true, that means Adam is also the Word of Allah. You are also the Word of Allah. I'm also the Word of Allah. But nowhere does the Quran call anyone except Jesus the That's Word right. of Allah. Right. So if that argument is true, is valid, then Adam should have been called the word of Allah because he's created by Allah's word, his command. Yeah. But he's not. Showing that Jesus is not called the word of Allah 
because God created him by his command. He's called the word of Allah because Muhammad, again, is hearing Christians. That's right. Identifying Jesus as the Logos of God, the word of God, Yohanine Christology, John chapter 1 and 1 John chapter 1 and Revelation 19, 13. He's hearing that. He's adopting it with the hopes that Christians will now take his message seriously because he's saying, look, see, I affirm what you affirm. He is the word of God. Not realizing and affirming that part of Christian theology, he pretty much destroys the entire foundation of his religion in that he ends up affirming Jesus must be eternal, one with God, inseparable from him, and not a mere creature. Another related point to that, why a Muslim cannot tell you what the word of God means in reference to Jesus. <clears throat> Many people may not be aware of this, but you are aware of this. Chapter 3, verse 7 of the Quran speaks of two sets of passages in the Quran. Chapter 3, verse 7 says, there are clear passages of the Quran. They That's are right. the mother of the book, foundational focus on them. But there are another set of passages that are said to be ambiguous, unclear, yeah. right? So there are two sets of passages in the Quran. One clear, focus on them. The other unclear, and then it says only those who have a disease in their heart will focus on the unclear passages in chapter 3, verse 7. But then it says only Allah knows their meaning. Now, many people may not be aware of this, but I encourage Christians, even Muslims, to look up Tafsir ibn Kathir, the abridged English translation, which they can read online for free. You can go to Q Tafsir, T A F S A S I R, Q T A F S I R dot com. Go and read what he says about the first 80 verses of chapter 3. According to all the Muslim commentators that I know of, they claim that the first 80 verses of chapter 3 were composed in response to Muhammad's debate with the Najrani Christians, Christians yeah, from Najran. apology against him. So yeah. he composed these 80 verses, which they believe was by Wahi, revelation from God, in response. According to Ibn Kathir, chapter 3 verse 7 was deliberately composed to refute the Christians using chapter 4, verse 171, where Jesus is said to be the word of Allah and the spirit of Allah to prove the divinity of Christ. In other words, the reason why Muhammad said there are unclear passages is because when the Christians started saying to Muhammad, hey, Muhammad, you said that Jesus is the word of Allah and he's the spirit of Allah. In fact, the two honorific titles given to Jesus in Islamic theology, he's the word of Allah, karimat Allah, ruh Allah, spirit of Allah, they used those very titles to prove that Jesus is God. They told him, wait, if he's the word of Allah and the spirit of Allah, then he's God. So what was Muhammad's response? Oh, those are unclear passages. Don't focus on them. Only Allah knows their meaning. How convenient when the Christians started using Muhammad's own words against them to prove that Jesus is God. He came up with the excuse. Their meanings are unclear. We don't know what it means. Only Allah knows what they mean. Now, here's the dilemma, though. If only Allah knows what it means for Jesus to be with the Word of God, how can a Muslim tell me what it means? That's right. And that's what we're noticing. I don't know if you're noticing this lately. It seems like the Muslims want to put in, a, in the mouth of their God and the Quran and their prophet oftentimes yes. things that they themselves didn't even say. You can't even find records of it. Yeah. Like in one of the sessions where it says about the Spirit. When Muhammad is asked about the Spirit, he goes, only a little knowledge is given concerning his identity. So Muhammad is silent about who the Spirit is, yet Muslims tell us it's Gabriel. That's Muhammad is silent on what it means for Jesus to be the Word of God because he doesn't know because he knows he just made a mistake because he affirmed the deity of Christ even though he didn't want to. And he says, well, don't focus on those statements. They're unclear. And yet Muslims tell us what it means even though Muhammad said he doesn't know, only God knows. So leave the meaning to God. Amen. And uh, that's basically why we call those uh, series Dilemma, because it's one dilemma after another. <laughs> and uh, our job is to really try to help our Muslim uh, friends. I mean, we're not here to mock anyone. We're here to help you see for yourself that oftentimes what you think is not what the facts are about. <clears throat> now, what we're trying to do in these series is to show, like you said, the Quran, not Islamic theology, the Quran doesn't teach Tawheed. And the Quran presents a contradictory, if not confusing, picture regarding issues such as the person of Christ. <clears throat> because in one breath, the Quran wants to say that Jesus is simply a human servant of Allah. But at the same time, it says things about Jesus that elevates him to divine status, <clears throat> essentially co-equal with Allah, even at the same time subject to him. Now, why do I want to talk about the virginal conception and birth of Christ? Because that's going to pose a dilemma, a problem for the Muslims because of what the Quran says <clears throat> regarding Allah not having a son. But first, let's look at the passage. Let's go to chapter 3, verse 71. 
as the Lord guides us by His Spirit <clears throat> and clears, uh, clears my throat. And we're going to see it right now on the screen. <clears throat> yep. Now, notice what it says here in 347. It says, Lord, this is Mary speaking Correct. to the angels. The Quran says that a group of angels came, announced to Mary that she's going to conceive and give birth to the Messiah, Jesus. Because in the previous session, we saw that Allah gave her glad tidings of a word from him, 345, whose name is the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, Ismuhu, Ismuhu, which Correct. is masculine, even though Kalimat is feminine. That's right. You elaborated on that in the previous session. Correct. Now, she asks a logical question. <clears throat> she's not married. She's a virgin, a chaste virgin. She says, how shall I have a son, seeing no mortal has touched me? Pay attention to that language. How shall I have a son, seeing no mortal has touched me? Even so, God said, God creates what he will. When he decrees a thing, he does but say to it be, and it is. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> it's easy for Allah to cause you to conceive and give birth to a child without sexual intercourse. After all, Allah is the one who created the entire creation and spoke it into existence from nothing. So a virginal conception of birth, piece of cake. That's basically what it's saying. So in saying this, it's pretty much agreeing with the biblical teaching that the blessed mother of our Lord Jesus conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and gave birth to her blessed, glorious son while a chaste virgin sexually. Now let's go to the other reference that touches upon Jesus' virginal conception of birth. Chapter 19 of the Quran, verses 16 to 21. Chapter 19, verse 16 to 21. It's a long passage. And here it is in front of us. Now it's long, but again, <clears throat> I'm going to read it <clears throat> so that people can follow the train of thought. Mention in the book Mary, Maryam, when she withdrew from her people to an eastern place and she took a veil apart from them, then we sent unto her our spirit, there again, spirit, we already discussed the significance, significance of this, that presented himself to her a man without fault. She said, I took, take refuge in the all-merciful from thee, if thou fearest God. He said, I am but a messenger, Rasul, apostle, come from thy Lord to give thee a boy most pure. We're going to revisit that language, boy most pure. As you know the Arabic better than I can imagine. It's Ghulamin Zakian. 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 That's correct. Pure, yeah. holy, <clears throat> faultless son. We'll revisit that a little later. Notice the response again. She said, How shall I have a son whom no mortal has touched, neither have I been unchaste? How can I get pregnant and give birth? I haven't had any sex with any man, and I am chaste. Response again. He said, even so thy Lord has said, easy is that for me, and that we may appoint him, Jesus, ayat unto mankind, and a mercy from us, it is a thing decreed. So, in both chapter 19 and chapter 3, we have the Quran affirming the virginal conception and birth of Jesus Christ. Now, you may be wondering why I keep saying birth. Because someone can say, she conceived as a virgin, but she didn't remain a virgin because she married Joseph and had intercourse before she gave birth to Christ. The Quran, in agreement with the Bible, teaches she had no sexual intercourse whatsoever from conception to the time she gave birth to the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and interestingly, the Quran doesn't even know that Mary was betrothed to Joseph. No mention of Joseph. That's right. No mention of the betrothal. And this may be interesting to people from, let's say, a Catholic or Orthodox or one of these traditional Christian backgrounds. One of the names of Mary in Islam is Al-Batul, meaning the virgin. That's right. Because in Islamic tradition, she remained a virgin. They affirmed the perpetual virginity of Mary. So not only did she conceive and give birth to Christ while a virgin, she remained a virgin throughout her entire earthly life. Now, with that said, <clears throat> why is this passage astonishing? Do you remember what Mary said? Supposedly said, because again, as we stated in previous shows, we do not believe the Quran is the actual word of Allah, meaning the true God. I keep saying Allah, forgetting that for most people, Allah is not the term they would use for God. That's right. But if you're speaking Arabic, that's the only term you'd use even for the God of the Bible. We don't believe the Quran is the true word of the true God, nor do we believe that the Quran contains the actual conversations of the prophets of Mary or Jesus. But with that said, notice the response in 347 and in 19, Verse 20 is, how can I have a son seeing no man has touched me? You yeah. know what's astonishing about that? And, and we can show the slide one more time yeah. uh, and uh, for, for yeah, if you want to yeah. follow it. You notice yes. it? It's, it's bold in there, right? There it is. How shall I have a son whom no man, 
no mortal has touched, right? So she's asking the question, how can I have a child? I don't, you know, have a husband. I'm not sexually active. So the assumption is she can only have a child through sexual intercourse if she procreates a child that's right. through the union of a male and female. Why is that astonishing? Because that's the very objection Muhammad gave in chapter 6, verse 101, as to why his God cannot have a son. In chapter 6, verse 101, it says, and I'm referring, I'm paraphrasing the Yusuf Ali translation, wonderful originator of the heavens and the earth, how can he have a son seeing he has no consort? Sound familiar? Yeah, <laughs> that's what Mary was saying. But what did Allah say to Mary? Oh, that's easy for me. You don't need to have sex. You don't need to have a man. He, a man doesn't need to get you pregnant. All I need to do is say B and you'll get pregnant. So why is it that Mary can conceive a child without sexual intercourse and have a true son, but Allah Almighty cannot have a son unless it's through sexual <clears throat> union with a consort? Yeah, I is mean, it? it's, uh, it's definitely a weakness on the God of Islam's side. Supposedly, yeah. he can do things that are easy for others yeah, for, to do. He can do it for a mere yeah. mortal, but he can't have a son unless he has sexual intercourse. Now, this entails another problem. Since the Quran is assuming that you have to have a father and mother to have a child, and since Mary conceived by Allah through the Spirit, without sexual intercourse, that means if I apply this Quranic logic... Because then Allah is the father. You got Yeah, because remember... You cannot have a child without a father or mother, because that's pretty much the logic of 6101. That's, I'm, go, I'm going with the logic of the Quran. I cannot have a son unless I have a consort, right? So in Muhammad's mind, to be someone's son, the only way you can be truly someone's son is if that person, in some sense, <clears throat> gave you your life, whether through sexual intercourse or by some other means, there's a sense in which a person has to be responsible for you receiving life. Well, who gave life to Jesus in Mary's womb? Allah, right? But more specifically, the Spirit. Did you remember in the previous session? Allah sent His Spirit right. to give Mary a son. He breathed the Spirit into Mary. She got pregnant. So the Muslims are left with one of two choices. Either Allah is the father of Jesus because He's the one who gave life to, to Jesus in His mother's womb without sex. We're not saying it was sexual because to the Christian it's just as blasphemous as it is to the Muslim to say that Allah would have sex, but still he's responsible for the life of Jesus, for that conception taking place, or it's actually the Spirit who is the Father of Jesus. That's right. Because who actually caused Mary to get pregnant without sexual intercourse? Yes. Welcome aboard, yeah, brother. Again, trusting the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit will do justice to these topics and speak truth without error for His glory, because Jesus Christ is worthy and we're in love with the Son of God. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Amen. That's why we're doing what we're doing. So, Sam, now, last time we talked about chapter 19, yes. verses 16 to 21. And again, let's qualify our use of the Quran. It's because we don't believe in it. We're quoting the Quran because Muslims believe in it. So we're showing them what their own source says about these issues. Now, we left off affirming that according to the logic of the Quran, either Allah has to be the father of Jesus because he's responsible for the life of Jesus, for Mary conceiving him, or more precisely, the spirit, which introduces the dilemma, how can the spirit be the father of Jesus? <clears throat> because he gave life to Jesus if he's not God. But anyway, right. let's continue elaborating this <clears throat> teaching of the virginal conception birth of Christ and its implication. Now, Jesus is the only one who is conceived to and born from a blessed virgin by the power of the Spirit of Allah, <clears throat> which Muslims think is the true God. Jesus' mother is the only woman mentioned by name in the entire Quran, Mary. I just want to bring out these points because you're going to see where I'm going with this to show that even the Quran acknowledges without wanting to do so. Muhammad started making statements about Jesus that he picked up from Christians, not realizing that in affirming those things, he was pretty much exposing himself in That's his right. Quran, showing that he's a false prophet. Now, Mary's the only woman mentioned by name in the entire Quran. There's a chapter named after Mary, Surat al Medium, chapter 19, which we read some verses from. So not only the only woman mentioned by name, she's the only woman that has an entire chapter named in her honor. And her family is the greatest family that Allah created, the most exalted of all human beings, all human families that Allah has created. And we're going to look at that in a minute. But wh where I'm going with this is this. Why is Jesus the only one who's born, and, born from a virgin, conceived to a virgin? Why is Jesus' mother the only woman mentioned in the entire Quran? Why is it her family's honored 
as the greatest human family that Allah created, that's actually chapter 3, verse 33 of the Quran. It says that of all the beings that Allah created, he, pro, he chose Adam. From Adam, he chose Abraham. And from Ab Abraham, the family of Imran. In fact, chapter 3 is named the chapter of the family of Imran. That's right. Why the family of Imran? Because Imran is supposedly the maternal grandfather of Jesus, the father of Mary. Why? The Quran doesn't tell us. And in chapter 3, verse 42, which we can use as a segue into the next uh, segment about Jesus' sinlessness. Chapter 3, verse 42, there the Quran says, Allah preferred Mary above all women, of all time, basically, all right. women, and purified her. Now, according to the Muslim expositors, when Allah created Mary, he created her to be absolutely sinless, free of all human imperfections, lustful desires, from her conception throughout her entire earthly life. He did the same for Jesus. So my question to the Muslim is, why did Allah give such honor to the Blessed Mother of our Lord, preferred her above all women, made sure that she was conceived and remained absolutely pure and sinless, and Jesus was absolutely pure and sinless, preferred her family above all creatures, the only woman mentioned by name, conceived and gave birth to Jesus without sexual intercourse by the power of the Holy Spirit. Why these honors lavished on Jesus and his mother and no one else? In fact, by way of contrast, just to contrast how amazing this is, you and I both know that according to the Islamic tradition, <clears throat> specifically narrations found in Sahih Muslim, the second most authentic <coughs> collection of narrations attributed to Muhammad and his companions, we're told in Sahih Muslim that the companions of Muhammad found Muhammad weeping at his mother's grave. Right. When they asked him, why are you weeping? He was weeping because he said, when I asked my Lord to forgive her, he refused. In other words, Muhammad was interceding for the salvation of his mother because his mother died as a pagan. She died during the time of Jahiliya, pre-Islamic ignorance. She was pretty much you know, a, a jahil, so to speak. And Allah said, no, I won't forgive her. So according to this tradition, Muhammad's mother is in hell. Another tradition, a Muslim says, a man came to Muhammad, whose father had died in the pre-Islamic period, what they call jahiliya. Correct. So he died a pagan. He said, where's my father? Muhammad said, he's in the fire. So the man walked away sad. So then he beckoned him and called him back. He says, not only is your father in the fire, my father is in the fire also. So Muhammad affirms, his father, who's named Abdullah, slave of Allah, go figure, a pagan, slave of Allah, he's in hell, and Muhammad's mother's in hell, and it, Muhammad is supposed to be the greatest man that Allah created, and yet Jesus' mother, the greatest woman, absolutely sinless, her family, the greatest of all families, conceived and gave birth to Jesus while a virgin. Why? The Muslims don't have the answer. Mystery of mysteries, my brother. <clears throat> we so. have the answer, though, right? because he's the eternal son of God and the only befitting way for God's eternal, glorious, holy son to enter into creation was through a virgin without sexual intercourse so that people could know through the conception that God was truly his father. And I want to hammer this point. As God, Jesus has a father, no mother. Do you know that? God is his father. As God in his divine nature, he has a father, no mother. As man, as human, he has a mother and no father. Now tell me he's not astonishing. Mary is great because of who her son is. He's the God-man who elevates her to the status of being the greatest woman that God ever created. Amen. Amen. With that, brother, that will lead us into another important topic related to Christ, and that might take us a couple of <coughs> sessions, the sinlessness yes. of Christ, according to the Quran, actually. Yes, yes, yes. In fact, if, if we can, if we want to go, to start with the sinlessness of Christ, we need to first see what it says about... <clears throat> Jesus' maternal grandmother in chapter 3, verses 35 to 36. If we can have it, chapter 3, verses 35 to 36. People can see it right now. And you see, notice there, it says, when the wife of Imran, again, the Quran assumes that Mary's father's name was Imran. That's why in chapter 3, verse 33, it says, Allah preferred the family of Imran above all creatures, not Correct. just humans, Correct. all creatures. When the wife of Imran said, Lord, I have vowed to thee in dedication what is within my womb. Receive thou this from me. So she got pregnant. So it goes, I'm consecrating my child to you. Thou hearest and knowest. When she gave birth to her, she said, notice it's a female. Lord, I have given birth, birth to her a female. And God knew very well what she had given birth to. The male is not as the female. Side note, notice that the Quran acknowledges males as superior to females. But yep. we'll return to that in future sessions, right. God willing. I have named her Mary, in Arabic, Maryam. 
and commend her to thee. I entrust her to you with her seed to protect them from the accursed Satan. So notice her prayer. O oh Allah, protect my baby Mary and her offspring from the accursed Satan. Now, did Allah honor that prayer? Did Allah answer that prayer? Yes, because we find a tradition. When we go to the next slide, you're going to see there's a tradition. In Bukhari, <clears throat> right? Sahil Bukhari, and you and I both know Sahil Bukhari is the most authentic collection of narrations attributed to Muhammad and his followers. Sahil Bukhari, volume 4, book 55, number 641. Watch this. Did Allah answer the prayer? Watch. Yep. Narrated Sayyid bin al-Musayyib, Abu Huraira, the father of the cats, that's what it means. I heard Allah's apostle saying, watch this. There's none born among the offspring of Adam, but Satan touches it. Was Muhammad an offspring of Adam? That's right. Well, that means Muhammad just admitted, Satan touched me when I was born. A child therefore cries loudly at the time of birth because of the touch of Satan, except Mary and her child. Then Abu Huraira recited, and I seek refuge with you for her and for her offspring from the outcast saint. So according to the Hadith, Allah honored Jesus' maternal grandmother's request by making sure that Satan was prohibited, forbidden from touching his blessed mother and him, the only two human beings that Satan was not allowed to touch upon their births is Mary and Jesus. That's right. And, and I like the fact that you just mentioned Muhammad uh, acknowledged that he was touched. Yes, I mean, everyone was touched. He didn't include himself in this exception. Tainted and corrupted by Satan, except Mary and her son. Muslims, why? If and, Jesus and, and just that's a man. another thing, my friend, my brother here. You know, Muslims really try to claim that Muhammad is sinless yeah. by virtue of the forgiveness of his sin. I think if you ask Muhammad himself, probably he will tell you, I don't know where they got this idea from. I've been Definitely. appealing for to God to forgive my sins exactly. all the time. And another sign that Muhammad's request hasn't been granted why do muslims till this day keep praying for his salvation because every time they mention his name they say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the prayers of allah and the peace of allah be upon him why would they need allah's peace to be upon him if he's already in a state of peace that's right jesus that's right. is our peace he doesn't need our peace amen amen to that yes <clears throat> Uh, what about, uh, for instance, in chapter 19, 19, what it mentioned specifically about uh, Jesus? Oh, yeah. And uh, this, this is a teaser for the yeah, next the session. Next, yes, you know, yes. We want to venture into the phrase. Real quickly, that the 19, used. 19 says that yeah. the Spirit would give Jesus Ghulamin Zakian, a boy absolutely pure. And, and there we have the Arabic in transliteration. You know the Arabic better than anyone. Ghulamin Zakian. Zakian. Is that not the word? that denotes purity. That's right, purity. That's where we get the word zakah. You purify yourself by pain, basically. So, so this refers to Jesus being someone who is pure from conception all throughout his entire earthly ministry. So like his blessed mother in chapter 3, verse 42, where we're told that Allah purified her, meaning that when she was created, and this is according to the Muslim expositors. The Muslim expositors teach that when Mary was created, conceived in the, the womb of her mother, Allah made sure that she was conceived in a state of absolute purity, and she maintained that purity, absolute sinlessness, pure from all defects <clears throat> throughout her entire earthly life. Same thing with her son. Now, there is a narration attributed to Muhammad, in which Muhammad basically admits the sins of all the prophets, his own sins, with the sole exception. If we can look at that narration... Now it's a lengthy one. We're gonna. I'm gonna give the gist of it because I want to just look at the relevant part in which Jesus is mentioned. Now, in this narration, it comes from Sahih Bukhari, Volume Six, Book Sixty, Number Three. <clears throat> On the Day of Judgment, the Muslims are afraid to approach Allah because He's very angry. So they're gonna look for a, uh, a, a Shafi, an, an intercessor, intercessor, yeah, to give wasila to give them, you know, <clears throat> a connection. We hope that Allah will be merciful. So it says they went to Adam. Adam says, well, I'm not fit for it because of the sin I committed, because he ate of the forbidden tree. So then he says to, says to them, go to Noah. Noah goes uh, and tells them, well, I'm not fit for it because I sin by praying for my rebellious son, that Allah would save him. So go to Abraham. Abraham says, well, I lied three times, so I'm not fit for the test. Now notice each prophet is disqualifying himself That's right. from that role because of some sin, right? And, and I'm, I'm really confused, Sam, because I thought Muslims say that the prophets are sinless. But friend, these are minor sins. Don't oh, you yeah, I know. Okay. But they're so minor that it disqualifies them from the right of intercession. So very minor, right? 
<laughs> They're that minor, right? So minor you can't intercede. That's right. So what does Ibrahim say? He says, well, I lied three times. Go to Musa, Moses, right. with whom Allah spoke and gave him the Torah. And then Moses says, well, I killed a man. I'm not fit for it. So now let's look at that narration. We'll pick it up and from there. And now we're going to show the people the section about Jesus. So now notice what Moses is going to say who to go to. Go to Jesus. We got it boldened. Allah's slave, his apostle, and Allah's word and a spirit coming from him. Wow. I mean, Moses confirming what the Quran taught already. That's right. So go to uh, um, Jesus. He is the servant of Allah. And we, we agree that in the Bible, Jesus took the status, the position of a servant, became the servant of God the Father. His apostle, Hebrews 3, 1, the apostle of God the Father. Allah's word said of no one else but him and a spirit coming from him said of no one but him. So now notice here, Jesus is identified as the word and spirit of Allah from Allah. But now watch this. Jesus will say, I am not fit for this undertaking. Go to Muhammad, the slave of Allah, whose past and future, future sins will, were forgiven by Allah. Now notice, other forms of the narration say that Jesus didn't mention any sins. Did you catch it? Of all the prophets, they're all disqualified because of some sin. Here, Jesus mentions no sin because he's sinless, but he's still not qualified to intercede. But notice what is said of Muhammad. He supposes he's going to defer them to Muhammad, whose past and future sins were forgiven by Allah. So in this list, it's an amazing... everyone sins, especially Muhammad, with the exception of Jesus. That's, uh, it's an amazing thing. By the way, I'm starting to think Moses might be another person, you know, of Allah, because he's the one who instituted the pie prayers, you know? Yeah, And exactly. now he's the one who prophesied the 4171 in you, the Quran. You got, yeah, you're right. In fact, Mo Moses was more merciful than Allah, and that Allah wanted 50 prayers, and Moses actually convince Muhammad, man, 50 is too much. My community can only pray three times. Yeah. So again, he was more merciful than the most merciful. So, more on that to come. <laughs> yeah, in, in our series of Tawheed Dilemma. <laughs> but I want everyone to catch it. Jesus is the only one who mentions no sins. So you think he alone is qualified, but again, Muhammad has to make himself more than he is. So even though Muhammad is a sinner who needs forgiveness, he's the one who's going to intercede. But catch it. Jesus is sinless. All the prophets have sins that they're afraid to confront Allah with because they're afraid that their sins will disqualify them from interceding before the people. Now, I want you to read that citation that comes from Tabari about all the children of Adam have sins with the exception of who? If we can put it on the screen, you'll see. Very good. And I just want to say that this is a basically a tradition by Qatada. And, yes. and that's what we're going to show people right now on the screen. You're going to see Qatada uh, was reported by Al-Tabari. And who's Tabari, so they know? Uh, Tabari is one of the most renowned uh, Islamic scholars of tafsir uh, commentaries. So and no he Joe wrote Shmo. also history. He's a historian. Tariq yeah. al-Tabari. But yeah. so he's no Joe Shmo. He is That's one right. of the greatest scholars That's of right. the Quran. Notice what he says. Guys, I want everyone to pay attention. Jesus and his mother, citing Katada, did not commit any of the sins which the rest of the children of Adam commit. Now, can I that includes you? Muhammad. That's what I was going to say. Is Muhammad a son of Adam? Absolutely. So all the sons of Adam, Muhammad especially, committed sins. How dare Qatada say that? But two exceptions again. But are you noticing it's not just Jesus? It's Jesus and his blessed mother. That's right. The blessed mother of our Lord and her son. They're sinless. Now, here's the problem. Let me clarify. The <laughs> Bible never talks about the sinlessness of Mary. But Muhammad did. Exactly. The Quran does. Islamic tradition does. Right? That's right. So now, Jesus and Mary are absolutely pure and sinless. The only two descendants of Adam. Muhammad, everyone was a sinner. Now, even the prophet sinned, but Muhammad is not a true prophet. He's a false prophet. But with that said, can you do me a favor and read for us? We're not going to have it on the screen, but go to chapter 16 for 61 of the Quran. Again, I want to make sure we get this point. Jesus and his beloved mother, sinless. The only ones who are sinless. All the human descendants of Adam, Adam himself, sinned. That's right. Read 16 verse 61 for us. 1661 says the following. If Allah were to take mankind to task for their wrongdoing, for their sin, basically, yes. he wouldn't leave Hiran a living creature, Not a just living humans. being. Correct. Living creature, right? But he reprieved them to an appointment term. And when their term comes, they cannot put it off an hour, nor yet advance it. Now, let me, let me bring out the implication of this. If Allah were to punish people for their wrongdoing, he'd wipe out every creature. But Allah in his patience tolerates the sins of his creatures until the appointed day. So this passage is clear. Is there any creature who isn't a wrongdoer in the sight of Allah? No, it says all. I mean, <clears> and if Allah wanted to yeah. then punish 
creation for its sins, would he leave any creature alive? No, he says uh, not a not a living being, basically. So all creatures, right? Correct. And this is repeated in 3545. But wait, Al-Fadi, you just confused me. The Quran, the sound narrations attributed to Muhammad, Katada, <clears throat> all affirm Jesus and his blessed mother, absolutely pure, sinless, from conception throughout their entire earthly life, never committed any of the sins that the rest of the children of Adam did. Now, I'm really baffled. If Allah were to wipe out all creation for their wrongdoing, he'd be just because every creature has done wrong and deserving of punishment. But uh, Jesus and Mary are absolutely sinless. That's right. And that confirms biblical teaching that we're all sinners. Yes. All have but sinned. But wait, Mary is not a sinner. Yeah. Jesus is not a sinner. Now, if I apply Quranic logic, that means Jesus and Mary cannot be mere creatures. They have to be divine beings that became human. That's right. Special above. Okay, but hold on. How can Mary... Now, I understand Jesus. Jesus is God. That's what we're trying to prove. He's the eternal word, the eternal son, co-equal with the Father in essence, glory, nature, honor. He became flesh. So he is more than a creature. He's God in the flesh. But here it says, Mary is also sinless, pure, free of all sin. Therefore, according to 1661 of the Quran and 3545 of the Quran, Mary is no mere creature. She too must be divine either a goddess that became flesh, or she's the other member of the Islamic Godhead, which means that Muhammad ended up doing what he accused others of doing, because in 5116, Muhammad puts in the word, in the, in the mouth of Jesus, a conversation between him and Allah, where Allah asked Jesus, Oh Jesus, did you tell mankind to take you and your mother as two gods besides Allah? Well, in reality, it is Muhammad who has turned Jesus and his mother into Answer. two gods besides Allah, making Allah the third of three, or made Mary one of the members of the Islamic Godhead. And it's an interesting thing, by the way, that verse in the Quran, chapter 5, actually focuses, 5, 160, 160, 117, focuses on these two members, yeah. Jesus and his mother. There you go. Why? Why the two? Hey, by the way, I'm, I, I keep counting so far. It's quadrinity. Yes, right. You know? It's all spirit, <laughs> Jesus, and now Mary. Uh, we're going to get into pentinity Ooh, and uh, we're gonna go into octinity. And, yeah. Okay, very good. You know, so, so far, four, right? And, and they have Even a problem Mary. with our trinity? Yeah, exactly. Now, in the previous session, we mentioned that the Quran not only talks about Jesus being absolutely pure and perfect and sinless, it says the same thing about his mother, and the Islamic tradition confirms that Jesus and his blessed mother are absolutely pure, perfect, which shows that they're not mere creatures. Because you remember in 1661 of the Quran, and 3545 of the Quran, it says that if Allah were to take into account <clears throat> people for their wrongdoings, he would not leave a single creature alive. But in his patience, he tolerates them until the appointed day, the day of judgment. So no creature is sinless in the sight of Allah. And yet the Quran and Islamic tradition says Jesus and Mary are sinless. What do you end up with? Jesus and Mary are no mere creatures. They must be fully divine beings that became flesh. So either that means there are four persons in the Islamic Godhead or there's more than one God. But let's right. continue to elaborate the things that the Quran says about Jesus in which Muhammad is aping, taking over what he hears from Christians, what they say about Jesus, and he makes it part of his own theology, hoping that in doing that, he'll entice them to consider his prophetic claims, not realizing that by adopting those titles or descriptions or characteristics, he was pretty much exposing himself as a false prophet. Take, for instance, the Quran calling Jesus El Messiah 11 times. 11 times in the Quran, Jesus is called El Messiah. We'll look at just one of those 11 instances in chapter 3, verse 45 of the Quran. Which people can see right now uh, in front <clears throat> so, of them. So notice what, it's the angel supposedly speaking to Mary, and they say, and remember when the angel said, O Mary, lo Allah giveth thee glad tidings of a word from him, whose name is the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. Now, we've already looked at this mm -hmm. in previous sessions. And here is the title. The Messiah. Right. But remember, we highlighted the fact that the word for word in Arabic is kalimat, kalimat minhu, kalimat yeah. is feminine. That's but right. notice that the word is a masculine subject. It's a, it's a person, it's a male person, because it says, Ismuhu, whose name, his name is right. the Messiah, right. Jesus, son of Mary. And I just want to emphasize Please. one thing, brother, here, that he's called glad tiding, good news. And just a side note, Muhammad's birth wasn't announced in the Quran, nor, nor that Nothing. it was mentioned as good news. Nor, but we know then that's going to segue into the Old Testament prophesying the birth of the Messiah. Now, although the Quran calls Jesus al Messiah 11 times, it doesn't tell us what the title means. Nowhere in the Quran will you find a definition of the title Messiah. 
Therefore, if you're in doubt, as the Quran tells you, chapter 10, verse 94 of the Quran, Surat Al-Yunus, 94, it says, if you are in doubt concerning That's right. the revelations we've sent down to you, ask the people who've been reading the book before you. That's so right. if you have, 10, verse 94. Yeah, if you have doubt about something in the Quran pertaining to previous history, previous dispensations, previous scriptures, like in chapter 17, verse 101, and 1643, it says, in the case of Is Israelite history, ask the Israelites. In the case of, you know, the Jews and Christians, in 1643, says, ask the Ahl al-Dhikr, the people who've been reading the Dhikr before Muhammad. So, here the Quran says, Jesus Messiah, doesn't tell us what it means. So now, they need to ask us. Why is Jesus called the Messiah? What's the significance of Jesus being the Messiah? Well, when we go to the scriptures, God's true word, the Holy Bible, we see that the prophets, centuries before the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, announced the coming of the Messiah. And this messianic figure is not a mere man. He is a human being, a physical descendant of David, because the promise of Messiah was given to David and his line. But he's more than that. He's God in the flesh. And let's prove it. I'm going to be reading passages from the scriptures. I'm going to go to Isaiah 9, okay. 6 to 7, which and, is clearly... Uh, I'm going to write it down for people. <coughs> Isaiah 9. 6 to 7. Clearly a messianic prophecy, right? For unto us a child is born. Notice the language. Unto us a son is given. And by the way, in Isaiah 9, 1 and 2, it says this is going to take place around Galilee of the nations, Galilee of the Gentiles, by the way of the sea, by the Jordan, the Sea of Jordan. A great light has dawned to those who are in darkness. Where? Galilee of the Gentiles. Don't forget, Galilee. Amen. And if we can show the slide, by the way, uh, that I had last, uh, I'm writing down these references right yes, there. Yes, Isaiah people. 9, 6 to 7, All right. with 1 and 2. Now, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. This child born, his name is Wonderful Counselor, mighty, the Mighty God, mighty God El exactly. Gibor. That's right. The everlasting Father, the Father of eternity, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. So his government never ends. Upon the throne of David, that's why it's messianic. It's a promise that this child will sit on David's throne. And upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. So this child will reign on David's throne forever as the mighty God. Now what's interesting about this, El Gibor is used of Jehovah in the next chapter of Isaiah. That's right, Isaiah chapter basically Chapter 10, 10. verses 20 to 21 of Isaiah. That's it right. says that a remnant shall return, a remnant shall return unto the mighty God, El Gibor. So Jehovah is the mighty God. This child born is the mighty God, a child born to rule on David's throne forever. So he's an eternal king. You know why that's astonishing? The Hebrew words, a child is born, is yelid yulad. That's right. Yelid Yulad. In Arabic, lam yalid wa lam yulad. You know where I'm going with this. <laughs> chapter 112 of the Quran, Surat al ikhlas chapter 112, verse 3, it says, Allah neither begets nor is begotten, lam yalid wa lam yulad, meaning mm -hmm. Allah would never be born as a baby, right? That's right. Here's a prophet writing over 700 years before the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, about 20, 20 years before Muhammad, and he says, the mighty God of heaven himself will be born as a child. So here you have a prophet saying that chapter 112, verse 3 of the Quran is wrong because Allah will be born, meaning the true God, the Allah of the Bible, not the Allah of the Quran, will be born as a child. And that child is the Messiah who sits on the throne of David. So if that's the case, Jesus is the Messiah. And the prophet says the Messiah is the mighty God born as a child to reign on David's throne forever. Muslims, you have a problem. And affirming the Messiahship of Jesus Muhammad ended up bearing witness to his deity, even though that's not what he intended to do. Yeah. You uh, basically closed last time talking about uh, the title Messiah. We started it basically from the Quran, chapter 3, verse 45, but right. then we proceeded to go to Isaiah, yeah. chapter 9. The reason why we did that is because the Quran doesn't define the term Messiah. So that left it up to the Jews and Christians to go back to their scriptures to define the term. Even though Jesus is called Messiah 11 times in the Quran, it doesn't tell us what it means. So in Isaiah 9, we're told that the Messiah is not just a descendant of David, a human, physical <clears throat> descendant of David who sits on David's throne forever, because the only one who can sit on David's throne is a descendant of David. It calls him the mighty God, El Gibor, a title that belongs only to the true God. So the true God of heaven will be born as a child to rule on David's throne forever. 
there are other references in the Hebrew Bible that identify the Messiah as a divine person, an eternal divine person that becomes a flesh and blood human being in order to fulfill the promise given to King David. So he had to be a physical descendant of David. We're going to go to Daniel 7, 13 and 14, and we're going to see what our Lord Jesus does with these passages. Daniel 7, 13 and 14 is the next passage. And I'm going to write it down also on my slides yes. for people. Daniel so they can look at it. 7, 7 13 and 14. That's right. I saw in the night visions. Now, by the way, Daniel prophesied nearly 600 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, and he did so in the power of the Holy Spirit. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, pay attention, one that resembled the Son of Man, meaning looked human, had a human appearance, came with the clouds of heaven. So he's riding the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days. Notice there are two figures. The Son of Man rides the clouds, approaching the Ancient of Days. The New Testament will identify the Ancient of Days as God the Father. So the Son of Man is not the Ancient of Days. He approaches him. And they brought him near before him. And there was given him, the Son of Man, dominion, rulership, and glory, and the kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him, or you can also render it as worship. His dominion, his rulership, his sovereignty, is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. So like Isaiah 9, this Son of Man figure is an eternal king with an eternal kingdom that can never be destroyed. And he's worshipped by people. By not just some, it says all people, nations, and languages. That means all the Muslim nations, all the Muslim peoples, the whole world must serve and worship this divine being who appears as a man, who rules over them forever. It's this is Daniel Especially 7. if you connect it to Book of Revelation, it becomes yes. even clearer who's being worshipped. Yeah, we know that's the Son of Man, Jesus. But I want you to see, this is Old Testament though. I don't want the Muslims saying, well, that's your New Testament scriptures. It's corrupted. It disagrees right. with the Old Testament. These are Old Testament prophets. But wait, I thought the Son of Man means that Jesus is just a human. Well, it is true. It means he's human, but it means he's more than human. He's God appearing in human flesh. That's right. That's what Daniel says. That's why it says one like the Son of Man, meaning although he's human, he's more than that. He's an eternal king who is fully divine, who is worthy of all worship because he rules forever. That's right. In order for him to rule forever, that means he lives forever. So like Isaiah 9, this being is fully divine. The child in Isaiah 9 who is born to rule on David's throne, the mighty God, this one rides the cloud, something that only God does, is worshipped by all nations and rules forever. Amen. Now, let's see what our Lord did with this prophecy, but I'm going to look at one more. Psalm 110, verse 1, written about a thousand years before our Lord Jesus' birth. Psalm 110, verse 1. This is a prophecy by King David inspired through him by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit revealed this to him. That's right. So a Psalm of David, Yehovah, the Lord said unto my Lord, Ladoni, Yehovah, Neom, Yehovah, Ladoni. Jehovah said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I might make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, according to the Psalms, Jehovah sits enthroned in heaven. And I'll give the references. We won't look at it. That's right. Psalm 2 verse 4, Jehovah is enthroned in heaven. That's right. Psalm 11 verse 4, Jehovah's throne is in heaven. Psalm 103 19, Jehovah's throne is in heaven from whence, from which he rules over the entire earth, the kingdoms of the earth. So these three Psalms, Psalm 2 4, Psalm 11 4, Psalm 103 19 says that Jehovah's throne is in heaven and from that throne he rules over all creation, especially the earth. For David's Lord to sit at God's right hand, that means David's Lord is a co-occupant with Jehovah of the same heavenly throne. In other words, if Jehovah's on the throne in heaven and David's Lord is sitting with him at his right hand, that means David's Lord is sitting with Jehovah on the throne in heaven, but David's Lord can only sit on the throne of Jehovah if he too is Jehovah, one with Jehovah. In other words, this opens up the door That's to right. a divine plurality, a plurality of persons That's in right. the essence of Jehovah, right? That's, a, that's where the word Ahad actually comes in handy. That's right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully we're going to impact that yeah. as well. So yeah. notice what these three prophecies say. Hmm. David's Lord is a divine person, a co-occupant of God's heavenly throne. <clears throat> the Son of Man that Daniel sees rides a cloud, something that only God does. He reigns forever and is worshipped by all nations, showing that he's truly divine. The child of Isaiah 9 who is born sits on David's throne. He's the mighty God. So three different prophecies by three different prophets all of whom affirm that this one who sits on the throne, the Messiah, is not just a human being, flesh and blood human being That's born, right. but he's also God in the flesh, distinct from God, and reigns with God forever and ever. 
And not only that, brother, I mean, I'm sure you're going to probably touch on it. If we go to Psalm 110.1, our Lord used this and to that's prove going, yes. his, that's his divinity. divinity. That's why now I want to show you what Jesus and the New Testament writers do with these prophecies. So don't forget the Son of Man who rides the clouds. David's Lord who sits on God's right hand. And maybe we should stop right here <laughs> because we want to pick it up in another session where we talk about how Jesus now unpacked all of this so that it becomes even clearer that Jesus used all of these fabulous passages that you have just referenced to reveal his divinity. Because we want our Muslim friends to see that Jesus himself did acknowledge his divinity. Because this is the, their argument, as you know, that Jesus never said that he is God, as if he has to say, I am God, worship me. That's right. So, Sam, in the last yeah. couple of sessions, you've been really unpacking the title Messiah, yes. or the Messiah, as mentioned of Jesus in the Quran, and showing how that will be a devastating, it is. actually, title. Annihilation. Because it yeah. elevates the status of Jesus automatically if we were to rely on the Old Testament alone, Just, not yeah, to mention, exactly. of course, the Bible in general. Yeah, yeah so now I want to further confirm that when the Quran says Jesus the Messiah, without explaining it, that means the Muslims have no choice but to go to the previous scriptures to find out what it means. And we said that to be the Messiah means you have to be a king from the line of David who's God in the flesh. Let me just look at two references from the New Testament to show that even the Jews know, knew Messiah is a king. So he's not just a prophet. Here, Luke, uh, Luke 23, 2-3. Luke 23, 2-3, it says, And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, meaning Jesus, and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. So to claim to be Christ is to claim to be a king. And Pilate asked him, as Jesus, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest this. You, you even say it. And this is again confirmed in John 19, 12. John 19, 12. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. See, he claims to be Christ. He makes himself a king. And you know that if he's going to make himself a king, he's opposing Caesar, so you got to punish him. Right? So clearly, Old New Testaments agree. Messiah is the king. New Testament says Jesus Messiah, the Quran agrees. Therefore, the Muslims cannot escape the fact that by acknowledging Jesus as Messiah, they're acknowledging Jesus is king. But if Jesus is not on earth, as the New Testament confirms and the Quran agrees, and Islamic tradition verifies, but he's with God above the heavens, then that means Jesus must be a king ruling from heaven over the earth. You can't escape that, that argument. But we, even before we go there, let me show you what the angel Gabriel said to Mary. You remember the prophecy in Isaiah 9? That's right. It says in Isaiah 9, verse 1 and 2, a great light will shine from Galilee of the nations, and that great light will be a child born, a son given, to reign on David's throne, who is the mighty God, right? That's right. Now here's what's ironic. Muslims say that the angel Gabriel came to Muhammad. Yet the message of Gabriel about Jesus to Muhammad contradicts the message this Gabriel gave to Mary. So not only do you have in the Quran a counterfeit God, a counterfeit Jesus, a counterfeit spirit, you even have a counterfeit Gabriel. It's not the real McCoy. Because right. let's see what the real Gabriel said to Mary. Luke 1, 26 to 33. <clears throat> Luke 1, 26 to 33. Remember the language. Galilee of the nations, a great light. Great. Child born, son given, sits on the throne of David. And then the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The prophecy in Isaiah 9 says he'll sit on the throne of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. The Lord is with you. Blessed art thou. Blessed are you among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou, you have found favor with God. And behold, you, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. Unto us a child is born, a son is given. You will bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, a great light from Galilee. Where is this? Galilee and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Isaiah 9, 7 says, He will sit on Amen. David's throne, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. You can't get any clearer than this. Right. Old Testament, New Testament agree. Messiah is the Son of God, a child born, the mighty God in the flesh, sitting on David's throne, ruling it forever. They both agree over against Islam. Now, with that said, 
Does the Quran affirm what the New Testament says, that when Jesus died and was raised physically to immortal life, where he was made physically indestructible, he then ascended to the right hand of God and sits enthroned with the Father in heaven. Does the Quran affirm Jesus' physical ascension to God, even though the other Quran is not his Father and he's not the true God? Does it affirm it? Absolutely. Go to chapter 3, verse 55 and read it for us. And I want everybody to follow along with us here. So you see what it says? And when God said, I want everyone to hear this. Now, this is not the true God, but still, for argument's sake, when God said, Jesus, I will take thee to me and will raise thee to me and I will purify thee of those who believe not. I will set thy followers above the unbelievers till the day of resurrection, resurrection day. Then unto me shall you return and I will decide between you as to what you are at variance on. Now, notice what Allah supposedly tells Isa, Jesus. I will gather thee to me and raise thee to me. Right. It is saying, okay. I will raise you yeah. to the second heaven That's or the right. third heaven. Because no, no. in Islamic theology, there are seven heavens. Above the heavens. I will raise you to me. Take you to me. Throne. Wherever Allah is, He's there. Now, this he's is also confirmed in 4158. What does 4158 say? And I just want to say one thing here. Uh, uh, this is just for uh, a side note. Maybe in the future we can do it. If we can go back to this slide, I want to note, uh, no, you know, show something that God is clearly making a distinction in the Quran, supposedly, between those who follow Jesus and those who don't. Those who don't follow Him are called unbelievers. Exactly. Not submitters. Unbelievers. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. All right. Now, if you go to 4158, it further confirms that Allah took Jesus to himself. And We're almost here, done here. Here it is. Notice, it says, God raised him, Isa, up to him. Not to the second heaven or the third heaven. Up to him, where Allah is, God is almighty always. Now, the mutawatir ahadith, meaning the multiply attested narrations attributed to Muhammad, say that Allah took Jesus physically to himself and Jesus will return physically, which we'll talk about in a future session. So Jesus was taken physically to Allah and will return physically at the end to kill the Antichrist, al Messiah al-Dajjal, and rule the entire earth for 40 years. And we'll talk about the second coming in a future session. But here's the problem. These two passages explicitly say Allah took Jesus to himself. So I asked the Muslim, where is Allah? Now, if it's a Salafi Muslim, he'll tell me he's above the seven heavens, above the throne. Being above the throne signifies that Allah has supreme power, sovereign authority over all creation. Now, according to Tawheed, Tawheed al rububiya Tawheed al rububiya right. Allah alone is exalted above creation as its Lord. But wait, here it says, Allah took Jesus to himself. So if Allah is above the seven heavens, above the throne, guess where Jesus is? He's above the heavens and above the throne. But to be in that position means that Jesus is with Allah over creation as sovereign Lord. That's the implication. Not only that, Jesus is there physically and bodily. And not only that, wow. but I can even take it further. Yes. This even confirms that the only person who can see Allah is Jesus himself. And he's with him. See him in the bosom yes. of the Father. So here again, Muhammad yeah. apes what he hears from Christians, takes over what he hears from Christians, adopts it as part of his religion, not realizing he's destroying the very claims he makes as a prophet. Because remember what we read in the previous session, in, in chapter 18, 26 of the Quran, and chapter 25, verse 2, it says, Allah does not share his rule with anyone. He has no son or partner's dominion. And yet here in these two verses, Jesus is with Allah above the throne, thereby sharing in his rule over creation, you have a clear-cut contradiction thanks to Muhammad. And here is what I want to add, my brother, here. Yes. Allah himself announced to Mary the coming of the good news of Jesus, yes. his word. Yes. So he came from Allah and he goes exactly. back to Allah. Because Jesus didn't originate yeah. from the dust like everyone else, That's like right. Muhammad returned to dust, Adam yeah. did. He came down from Allah as his word and went back. So he went back from where he came. He came down as a spirit, took flesh, went back up in flesh. If you didn't know any better, you think a Christian wrote those portions of the Quran. That's right. And it's a there copy and paste. And uh, we really commend Muhammad for uh, inventing the copy and paste uh, technology. Even though it's full of contradictions. And that's it. So Jesus is a member mm -hmm. of the Islamic Godhead, whether Muslims like it or not.
Well, brother, I mean, uh, of course, this is the conclusion, at least, of this part of the series. Yes. But uh, there is a lot, a lot uh, to more come, to talk about. and uh, we will be doing more and more of this. And by the way, uh, pray for us. One of the things that uh, we're appealing to you, of course, to always partner with us, uh, is to enable us to, me and Sam, to begin to do live shows on a monthly basis, at least at the beginning, hopefully through Zoom, uh, via Facebook, and uh, YouTube, as well, YouTube yeah. uh, as well, in other ways, so that we will be able to add your immediate questions and you will be able to ask uh, my brother uh, things that are on your heart basically from some of his reading uh, I mean writings and so on and so forth so uh, you can see why we're always honored and blessed to have uh, our dear brother with us here uh, because we want to serve the Lord together and we want to partner together but we covet your partnership with us as well and your prayers brother Thank you so much. And uh, one Jesus more Christ. again, uh, one more time, uh, remind people how they can get a hold yes. of you. Uh, AnsweringIslamBlog.wordpress.com. That's where you're going to find my latest articles, and I regularly update the blog. You can also find <clears throat> my older material on AnsweringIslam.net by going to individual authors. And then please subscribe to my YouTube page, Shamunian, S-H-A-M-O-U-N-I-A-N. And hit the like buttons on the videos and pass it on. And you can find ways of supporting me financially on my YouTube page as well as on my blog. And do pray for that support because, again, we're in full-time ministry depending on the goodness of the Lord working through His people. Because i got two angels to take care of, my precious Sarai and Zippor. So pray for them that God will bless them richly Amen. and bless your family for the glory of Jesus. Thank you. And uh, you might be surprised to know that I, too, have uh, just few articles uh, on Answer in Islam, and uh, I pray that we'll be able to continue, of course, Amen. to add more to that. I love to do a lot of videos because to me, I feel like, you know, talking it out and expressing it, yep. uh, uh, you know, delivers the message a lot faster, for, at least from my perspective. So uh, remember also to go to my YouTube channel, Sira International, become a subscriber, and also we encourage you to prayerfully consider to become a Patreon patron and give to our ministries, uh, mine or Sam's, as little as one dollar sometimes uh, could be more than enough, uh, basically, if many of you will do that. And we thank yeah. you again for your partnership. Amen. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe. Also, hit the bell so that you don't miss future videos. And please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Sira International. And together, we can introduce Muslims to the gospel of Jesus Christ.